We know from research that people who strongly want to avoid discomfort and unpleasant feelings and pain tend to be less emotionally resilient. So again, that would be a bad philosophy of life psychologically. And the Stoics, like the Cynics, have this other philosophy that says we should endure voluntary hardship, that it's healthy to be able to experience pain and not to view it as catastrophic. Do you want to know what it is? Body, mind, empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter, quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven. Everything the body needs. Control your mind. Welcome to the Body, Mind, Empowerment Podcast. I'm your host, Seamland, and our guest today is Donald Robertson. Donald is a writer about Stoic philosophy and an expert in cognitive behavioral therapy. He's written several books like How to Think Like a Roman Emperor and Stoicism and the Art of Happiness. This episode is brought to you by Katsu Training. Katsu bands incorporate blood flow moderation training that trick the body into thinking that it's lifting heavier weights than it actually is. When traditional weightlifting requires you to reach 70 to 80% of your one repetition maximum to stimulate muscle hypertrophy, then Katsu achieve that effect only at 20 to 30%. So it's perfect for treating injuries or use when you don't have access to heavy weights. Research about Katsu bands also shows it lowers blood pressure, speeds up recovery from injuries, releases stem cells, builds muscle, burns fat, and prevents age-rated muscle loss. These things are a game changer and I use them almost every day. If you want to try out the Katsu cycle bands, then use the code SEAM for a 10% discount at katsu-global.com. That's katsu-global.com and the 10% code is SEAM, S-I-I-M. Donald, welcome to the show. Well, thanks very much for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here speaking to you today. Yeah, you too. And uh, I've read uh, a lot of your books and they're really good in, uh, in terms of um, talking about stoicism as well as giving like a very practical uh, life advice of how do you implement this kind of philosophy and how do you like actually use it to like just living a happier and a better life. Uh, but uh, how did you get interested in stoic philosophy and how did you start writing about it? Well, actually you talked about this a little bit in... Uh, how to think like a Roman emperor because my editor insisted that I say something about how I got into this subject and uh, really ultimately I think it was because I grew up in a town in Scotland where Freemasonry was a very popular thing. Most of my friends parents were Freemasons and my father was and my father passed away he left uh, when I was about 14 years old he left behind some books about Freemasonry and I started to read about it and I realized that it gave my father a kind of a virtue ethic, a philosophy of life, and it was based around, in part, Hellenistic philosophy. The, I saw in the book mentions of the four cardinal virtues of Plato, or Pythagoras, and other kind of Hellenistic philosophical terms. So that got me on this quest looking for some kind of guide to life, some kind of philosophy to life. And I, I read all the world's religions. I read Taoism and... Uh, Hinduism and Christian apocryphal texts. I studied philosophy at university, but it wasn't until I finished my degree in philosophy that I discovered Stoicism. And it clicked for me because it, it kind of covered three things. It gave me a bunch of practical techniques, and I'd been learning a lot of self development techniques. Like I was very interested in self hypnosis and meditation techniques and visualization and stuff. And I saw in the Stoic texts all these different mental techniques, psychological techniques. And I was interested in psychotherapy. I began training as a counselor and psychotherapist. And I realized that stoicism was the inspiration for modern cognitive behavioral therapy. And I wanted this big philosophy of life as a kind of substitute for religion in a way. And I'd been looking at Buddhism and at Marxism and existentialism. And then I saw stoicism and I realized it gave me this kind of virtue ethic, this kind of guide to life. And all of these three things, the therapy, the meditation, the philosophy of life, all suddenly came together like an epiphany for me really. And that was Gosh, it was, I think it was about 25 years ago now, roughly, and so it stayed with me. And mm. it, it kind of, uh, I remember joking at the time, I suddenly thought, I'm not going to have to read as many books now. Like, cause I'd been reading Freud and Jung and all these different things. I thought, oh, gee, I can just read the Stoics because it gives me all of these different things I'm looking for. Mm. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, it's so true that uh, you know Stoicism, Stoicism is like an old philosophy, but at the same time, it's like ageless or timeless. The same yeah. principles apply to 2020 as well as you know uh, 20 BC, so to say. So that it's a very yeah like age, age old um, way of thinking, and it's also not not only like a philosophy; it's always like a mental uh, mindset and a way of thinking that uh, you know you don't have to be necessarily a philosopher to be a Stoic. Uh, but it does help you to kind of create a life philosophy, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in the ancient world, in the Hellenistic period, I should say, um, there was this kind of contrast that everyone knew about between two ideas of what it would mean to be a philosopher. So one of them came from Plato, who founded the Academy. And we say today that something is very academic. That's kind of a reference to Plato's school, the Academy, very scholarly and kind of bookish. But Plato had this rival, Diogenes the Cynic, who wasn't interested in logic and theology and metaphysics. And he sneered at Plato for doing all these things. And for Diogenes, philosophy was more like a Western yoga. It was about strengthening your character, um, you know, developing the, the virtues. And so in the ancient world, people thought, well, these are two very contrasting ideas about what it means to be a philosopher. And the Stoics, I think, tried to find a middle ground. They thought it would be bad to become overly bookish, like the academics in, in their ivory tower. But Diogenes maybe sneers too much at learning and education. And the Stoics, I think, wanted to say that it's good to study metaphysics and logic and all of these things insofar as it helps us to become better people. But if we end up just studying these things too much for their own sake and spending all our time in the basement of libraries, then that would become kind of an intellectual vice in a way. So I see them as wanting to find this balance between these two ways of understanding philosophy. But this idea of philosophy as a Western yoga has largely disappeared from modern academia. So modern academic philosophers now do spend all their time in libraries, really, and kind of theorizing and stuff. And so people think of the Eastern traditions of Hinduism and, and Buddhism more as kind of embodying what it would mean to have a practical philosophy. And I, I see modern, the interest today in Stoicism as a sort of resurgence of that people wanting to get back to, to the roots. This is why Stoicism is kind of timeless, because people, uh, modern academic philosophy, like existentialism and postmodernism, people see as being disconnected from everyday life, is too obscure, not really helpful. And uh, the ancient philosophies were simpler and more down to earth and more practical. And I think that's why people are interested in them again today. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, can you also give a, a little bit of like an overview about Stoicism? Like where does it come from and uh, what are like maybe is it the main uh, ideas of it? Yeah, sure. Um, so Stoicism is a Greek school of philosophy. It's founded at Athens in 300, 301 BC by a Phoenician merchant called Zeno of Citium. And uh, Zeno was actually shipwrecked. He was a very wealthy man. And he, according to one version of the story, he lost all of his fortune at sea and wound up shipwrecked as a, a, an immigrant uh, in Athens, you know, with a, a home to stay in, not really knowing what he was going to do with himself. He made this joke. He said the most fortunate voyage that he ever went on was the one where he lost everything mm -hmm. um, because he said that allowed him to discover his, his purpose in life his calling in life. It was the best thing that ever happened to him was losing his entire fortune in a shipwreck, <laughs> ironically. So the Stoics love these paradoxes. And he studied all the different schools of philosophy, or most of them, and I think he was trying to reconstruct an earlier philosophy that goes back a couple of generations, uh, which is the original philosophy of Socrates. So the Stoics were very interested in Socrates. I think they were trying to study the fragments of his philosophy and trying to, to get back in some respects to what he taught. And so what they took from Socrates is this idea that virtue is the only true good. So Stoicism is, um, of all the schools of ancient philosophy, it's the one that places the most emphasis on psychological resilience, on mental well-being, on therapy. And that's one of the reasons it's popular today. But the odd thing about it is that for Stoics, these psychological techniques, this therapy is grounded in an ethic, in what we call a virtue ethic. And that really resonated with me as a, a therapist because I realized that it seems like common sense, 
that your values are going to have an effect on your emotions. Um, if you place a lot of value on other people's opinions of you, you're kind of going to be setting yourself up for social anxiety potentially. You know, whereas if you place a lot more emphasis, a lot more value on your own appraisal of yourself, then you're going to be more resilient to other people's criticisms. So it seemed to me that the Stoics were right about that. So their whole philosophy is grounded in this idea that uh, moral wisdom or virtue, arete, is the most important thing in life and possibly mm. the only true good. And if you if you want, I'll explain the argument that that's based on because it is a philosophy after all. I'll explain it to you very briefly. It comes from Socrates. There's a, there are several arguments that Stoics use to reach this position. And one of them, uh, the best one, is in a platonic dialogue called the Euthydemus, where Socrates asks, what is good fortune in life? And his interlocutor says, well, it's good looks and health and wealth and reputation and social status. And, you know, it's a stupid question, Socrates. It's kind of obvious what good fortune consists in. And Socrates then says, let's go through these one at a time. He says, let's start with wealth because it's the easiest one. Surely if you give lots of money to a genocidal, sociopathic, like dictator, a tyrant, that would be a bad thing because he'd use all that money to do foolish and vicious things, right? And his interlocutor is kind of wrong-footed by this. He's like, ah, I guess so. But in the hands of somebody who's virtuous and good, wealth would be a good thing. So Socrates says, don't you think rather than being good in itself, it's merely an opportunity to do more good or more evil, depending on the nature of your character? And then he goes through and tries to prove this with all the other external goods. So that leads to the conclusion that none of these things that people normally assume are good are really intrinsically good. They're just a means to an end. And the thing that makes them good or makes them bad is the nature of our own character. So Socrates then kind of goes, voila! Like, so the only true good is moral wisdom and the only true bad is moral mm. vice. And the value of everything else depends on that. And the Stoics took these arguments that we find in Socrates and said, how can we actually put that into practice in day-to-day -day life? And so what you get from the Stoics is more of a system of philosophy as a whole way of life that's based on, these, on this ethic assumptions about values mm. yeah like it's so true in a way that uh, you can you know lose all your because yeah like the the money or wealth itself isn't uh, like uh, it doesn't have like character or something uh, you know only people who have character can you know use that wealth in a particular way they can use it for either good or bad and uh, that depends on their character and their goals and uh, they're like um, you yeah, like what are what are they trying to do and that sort of thing so yeah like and, and at the same time, like you can be very wealthy, but you can still suffer inside if you have like you know, negative emotions or if you're not happy inside and vice versa, like you can be very happy if you're poor or something. So the stoicism just uh, re reframes uh, where you find like the, like the optimal state of uh, well-being and uh, happiness. Well, an easy way to put that as well is if you think about the whole of human history, Throughout most of history, the vast majority of people have been much poorer in terms of technology and other resources than, than we are today. You know, our, our parents and our grandparents, and all the way through history, people had less than we do. And yeah. most of them were happier. Like we know from research, like depression is an epidemic today. So people are less happy yeah. than our, our ancestors were in the past, even though they had uh, less wealth. And uh, I also, just as an aside, the other thing I, I think about when I think about this argument is that over the years, uh, I've known a, a handful of quite wealthy people. And some of the, the wealthiest people I've known traveled on public transport, wore cheap clothes, you know, an old pullover and stuff, you know. And uh, so sometimes the people that have the most money don't really indulge in all of the things that people think they're going to squander. They, they maybe live quite simply and quite plainly because they're actually happier doing that. They're happier with simpler things and a simpler lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Um, and uh, like Stoicism is also like a, in, in good opposition to uh, Epicureanism, which is uh, another similar school of philosophy. And in Epicureanism, like the main uh, or the highest value is placed upon pleasure and uh, joy, which is like the opposite of Stoicism. Like how do you, how do you compare these two? And well, I'll say something about that. Like actually the first thing I'll say is just an observation. So Stoicism became very popular. There's a kind of trend for it at the moment. But Epicureanism didn't. Um, we always, they usually go hand in hand. And so we thought, 
well, there's going to be loads of people writing books about Epicureanism. There have been one or two, but there's no resurgence of interest in Epicureanism. And Epicureanism isn't popular with psychotherapists, whereas Stoicism is. And there's a reason for that. And the reason for it is that some of the things the Epicureans say really clash with what modern research on psychotherapy and psychology tell us about the emotions. So one of the things we know today is that when people put a lot of value on achieving happiness or pleasure and avoiding pain, that can actually tie them in knots. It can be quite toxic um, because one of the things it forces them to do is to place far more attention than normal on their own subject subjective feelings. So generally when people are happier, their attention is outward looking. Um, they get on with doing healthy things in life. They engage in activities. And people who become very introverted and self-focused tend to be more prone to anxiety and depression. But the Epicurean philosophy, by saying that the most important thing are these feelings, kind of creates a lifestyle where we're very introspective, very self-focused. It's a modern psychologist thing. You know, that, that sounds like the way of thinking that depressed and anxious people have. It's a potentially actually sounds like a good idea, but it's a, a psychology that would backfire. Mm. Uh, when we try to control feelings of pain and pleasure, um, we often just kind of tie ourselves in knots. And the Epicureans also said the goal of life was hedone, or pleasure, but they also call it ataraxia, which means tranquility, or the avoidance of pain, or the avoidance of unpleasant feelings. And that in particular sets alarm bells ringing because people who have a strong aversion to feeling unpleasant experiences are uh, set themselves up for avoidance and uh, the suppression of feelings. And so we know from research that people who strongly want to avoid discomfort and unpleasant feelings and pain tend to be less emotionally resilient. So again, that would be a bad philosophy of life psychologically. Mm. And the Stoics, like the Cynics, have this other philosophy that says we should endure voluntary hardship that it's healthy to be able to experience pain and not to view it as catastrophic. Like, and in fact, you know, like when you do exercise, you experience discomfort and fatigue and stuff like that. And, and having a mindset that is willing to kind of expose itself uh, to a certain amount of discomfort is, is actually very healthy, the Stoics would say. So they say the goal isn't a feeling, the goal is to develop this toughness and strength of character. And that's what our flourishing consists in. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And like, you know, the problem with um, trying to be happy all the time or trying to achieve pleasure is that, you know, they're great, but they're not permanent. They're very transient and they can be wiped out very easily. Like you can literally lose your wealth uh, very easily. You can lose your, uh, you know, and there's also like the inevitable fate of aging. Like everyone is going to get older and, you know, you're going to lose your good looks. And, uh, and if, you, if, you, if, you, if you get attached to those uh, things, uh, these pleasures and uh, these external things, then uh, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure and you're setting yourself up for misery because you're going to lose them eventually and yeah like stoicism kind of prevents that in a way because you're not uh, attached to them uh, or like you're very loose in a way you can still enjoy pleasure that's like the misconception that stoicism is called you can still enjoy pleasure and you can still engage in these uh, pleasurable things but you're not ever like really attached to them and you're also like aware of the you know the uh, negative side of, and like the pain and that sort of thing so you're keeping yourself more resilient and uh, more adaptable to like ever-changing uh, circumstances yeah def absolutely you know and i guess the, there are many problems and all these problems are raised by ancient philosophers with the hedonism epicureanism is a more sophisticated form of hedonism but nevertheless it still has similar problems and so one of them is the people who adopted hedonistic philosophy they're going to have to struggle with the problem of shortcuts. So if you just want pleasure, can you just take lots of drugs? Like, can you just avoid anything that causes you any discomfort and stuff? And Epicurus said we should try and achieve long-term peace of mind and, and pleasure. But nevertheless, the Epicurean school was known for being kind of reclusive 
like uh, Epicurus had this private garden where he just did philosophy with his friends, whereas the Stoics did philosophy out in the agora where they exposed themselves to the general public, like, and they engaged with strangers in debate, so they were putting themselves out there more in public. And so the Epicureans had this idea that if you kind of tuck yourself away, like today people might go in a to a hippie commune or a retreat in the countryside somewhere, and you could le live this kind of idyllic life by avoiding other people. And Epicurus allegedly even said, don't marry, don't have kids, <laughs> like, because it's just stressful. Mm. Like, you know, you can have a much calmer, more peaceful life if you just kind of never do anything, you know, just stay in a nice garden in the, in the yeah. countryside. Um, and so it, it lends itself towards a kind of avoidant, withdrawn way of living, whereas the Stoics think, no, that's not what life is about. You know, life is about putting yourself out there and being active and engaging with the world more. Um, but learning, you know, the challenge is then to, to learn to, to, to engage with the world without being overwhelmed by the world. Mm, yeah, and uh, paradoxically, like, um, if you are, like, like engaged in you know, the, the good example of exercise it feels painful and it's hard but uh, you actually if you if you reframe it in your head as something positive and beneficial then you actually enjoy it and you find more happiness while doing it <laughs> so this is it's a very paradoxical state that you are like uh, inflicting yourself this pain or uh, discomfort but you're actually enjoying it and uh, i would ar argue that you would actually m enjoy it more you enjoy like the process of overcoming yourself and over you enjoy the process of putting yourself out there uh, more than just enjoying the pain where, or just enjoying the pleasure so to say when you, where, where you didn't have to put any effort in so like the putting the effort in and overcoming yourself and achieving greatness and achieving goals and those things uh, there's that's where like most of the happiness actually comes from and it actually is is like a larger or is greater you'd like this story um socrates tells a story that we today call the choice of hercules and it's what the, the Greeks called a protreptic, an exhortation. So it was a story that was designed to inspire mainly young men to become philosophers. And it's allegedly, it's the story that Zeno heard when he was in Athens and he'd been shipwrecked and it inspired him to become a philosopher. And in it, uh, Hercules is a young man and he reaches, he gets lost in the woods and he finds himself at a fork in the road and two goddesses appear to him. And one of them says, listen, if you follow my path, you'll live in luxury. Other people will wait on you. You'll have, you know, everything you could possibly want. You have this pleasant life. And the other goddess says, listen, I'll be honest with you. If you follow my path, it's going to be really hard work. You're going to have to do the 12 labors of Hercules. You're going to have to fight all of these monsters. You'll be cast out from society. You'll have many enemies fighting against you. Your entire life is just going to be like one constant battle like until the day that you die. And Hercules has to choose between these two things. And in the end, he chooses the path of Arate, like this difficult path, because he realizes that what he wants more than the feelings of comfort and pleasure is something that's almost like a sense of pride. Like, he wants to be able to take a step back and look at his life and have self-respect, like, self-esteem, to go, that's the kind of person that I want to be. Mm. And Epictetus talks about this to his students when he's teaching uh, Stoicism. He's a, the, f the famous Roman Stoic philosopher. And he says to them, you know, if Hercules had chose the other path, if he'd chosen the, the path of, of vice, they call it, or hedone, you could say of pleasure, and he just stay tucked under his blankets in bed all day being waited on by other people Epictetus says to his students he wouldn't even really have been Hercules at all he would never have been a, a hero at all he would have been nothing no one would be interested in him or care about him um, it was only by embracing all this hardship voluntary hardship again in his life the 12 labors that he made himself this iconic hero to the Stoics and he said you, you can only the irony is that it's only by doing difficult uncomfortable challenging things that you'll ever really gain any respect for yourself or pride in yourself like but if you avoid any difficulty or any challenge it might feel comfortable but you'll deny yourself the ability to ever take any pride in what you're doing yeah yeah and I'm, I would imagine like the the feeling of regret might might come back to haunt you if you uh, like at, at the end of your life you may feel regretful for not doing those things uh, that you knew you should have done or that you could have done. 
So uh, yeah, like uh, by the way, I like to put it as nobody has on their tombstone. So far, I've never seen anybody who's had on engraved on their, their tomb or their gravestone. I, I wish I'd spent more time in bed, or <laughs> yeah. I, I wish I'd spent more time on Facebook. You know, if only I'd spent more time on Facebook. Yeah, that's <laughs> no one saying. says that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and and this is this is kind of the a lot of the ideas that you talk about in one of your books, uh, stoicism and the art of being uh, happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, is there, is there anything uh, that you would like to add to the, like the concept of happiness about stoicism or some mis- misconceptions about it? Yeah, um, I think the main thing that I would say, and I, I've really always felt this. When, you know, when you do philosophy at university, you kind of study. Uh, to some extent, you, these questions of what what does it mean to be happy, and you know the the first thing is actually the the word that the Greeks use for happiness, uh, eudaimonia. Uh, it doesn't really mean happiness. It, it, it's a strange word. In Greek, it means having a good uh, guardian spirit, a good uh, divine spark within you, a good demonos. Um, and so we translate it loosely as meaning happiness. But even the English word happiness has changed its meaning over time. So in the English language, we do have this other word, hapless, which mm. means unfortunate. And that's the opposite of what happiness used to mean. Happiness used to mean fortunate, flourishing, doing well in life. And now the meaning of that word became degraded over time so that now people use happiness to just mean pleasure. Like if you say to people, what makes you happy? They'll say, oh, eating chocolate, <laughs> you know, watching Netflix. That's what really makes me happy. And what they actually mean is that these are things that give me pleasure. Yeah. But the word didn't mean that originally. Even the English word happiness meant what makes you flourish. Like what means that you're, you're doing well, you're having a, actually having a, a, a good life, a type of life that you could take pleasure, take pride in, you know? Um, and so I would say maybe the best way to put it is that, we need to distinguish between different types of happiness. So there's a superficial kind of happiness, which is really just pleasure, right? It's a feeling, it comes and goes, and then towards the end of your life, you look back and you can't even remember most of it. You think, yeah, I guess there were days when I ate a lot of chocolate, you know, or mm-hmm. did, you know, I, I lay out in the garden eating more, but I've kind of forgotten all that now. It doesn't really stay with you. You know, maybe it was pleasant at the time, but it doesn't really have any legacy for you. Um, and then there's another kind of happiness, which is more cognitive, more spiritual, it's deeper. And it's more like a sense of fulfillment or satisfaction that comes from being able to look at yourself and thinking that you're on the right track in life, that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're where you're meant to be, you're doing what you were meant to be doing, um, that you have a sense of purpose, um, and actually, when you're living like that and you think, you know, I, I really feel like I'm, what I'm doing right now is important and it's valuable and I take pride in it, you might be experiencing a lot of pain and discomfort. Um, you know, you might be doing things that, that exhaust you um, and dealing with people that frustrate you, but nevertheless feel that what you're doing is, is really worthwhile and, and valuable. So I think a lot of confusion is caused just by people not even as children being taught to distinguish between these feelings of pleasure and this mm-hmm. deeper sense of, of happiness that, that comes from uh, a sense of fulfillment in life. Mm-hmm. That's a harder thing to pin down. It comes from really identifying what your core values are in life. I, and making an effort to to live consistently in accord with them. Yeah, totally. <laughs> like, and especially in the like today's day and age, a, a lot of people are just solely relying on their feelings, and uh, they don't have any like they they don't have like this ideal uh, that they want to pursue towards. Um, uh, if they do have, then it's more often than not it is uh, still created like their culture or like the social media or like the celebrities or something like that so they're chasing the the, they're still chasing the ideal of this uh, pleasure so to say and uh, and the social gratification whereas yeah like you have to kind of you know whereas in the socialism there's the the virtuous character is the ideal that you want to pursue of being like this virtuous person and having like a a person with a high, 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 high like integrity and uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. 
the way that they think about it as well. The, the Stoics and Socrates also thought that we're all kind of hypocrites in a way, that we contradict ourselves. And, uh, you know, so Socrates had this method of questioning people. It's called the elenchus, which is the word that the Greeks used for cross-examining a witness and co-opt. Um, so you'd question someone and you'd spot out contradictions in what they were saying. And Socrates thought we should do this to ourselves and question ourselves about our values and, and spot where we're hypocrites or where we're contradicting ourselves. And he said, like, one of the easiest ways to spot that is that the values we apply to other people are often in contradiction to the 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 things that we the values that we apply to our own life and uh, we have a double standard as we'd say today so there's a really good example of that in xenophon's memorabilia now xenophon was a, a famous athenian general and he was one of socrates's best friends uh, he was a follower of him and he records a conversation where a young man came to socrates once uh one of his friend's sons asking about if he could, Socrates could introduce him to famous Athenians, to important people in Athenian society, to become his friends. And Socrates says, what are the qualities that you would look for in the ideal friend? This is a great question. And so they rattle off a list of things that they would really be looking for in the perfect friend. And then Socrates flips it around and says to the boy, to Critobulus, he says, how many of these qualities do you actually have yourself? And he's like, ah, I don't know, like not many of them. Like, and Socrates then says, haven't you got this all back to front? Like, rather than asking me to introduce you to people that are like that, you should have come to me and asked me how I could help you to become more like that yourself. And then other people would be drawn to you. They'd want to be your friend. Like if you had all the qualities you've just described to me, you should be trying to figure out how to improve your own character rather than trying to figure out how to get these kind of external goods of like having a, this right circle of friends and stuff you've put you've got everything back to front um and that's a great dialogue you know and in a way it sums up the, the essence of socratic philosophy there's a contradiction there he knows what would be admirable in someone else but he's just never really applied those values those qualities to himself so yeah. the the stoics like socrates want us to have a more consistent set of values to resolve all these contradictions and to really be living much more in accord with our, our own core values with the virtues as the stoics say hmm. yeah totally and uh, w one of the uh, stoic philosophers that i think uh, you know perfectly uh, exemplifies this uh, is uh, marcus aurelius uh, who we've also written a book about and uh, it's called how to think like a roman emperor <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about like who was marcus aurelius and uh, what did he talk about marcus aurelius strangely in a way is the last famous stoic of antiquity so we mentioned zeno who was the founder of stoicism now marxism and psychoanalysis and postmodernism and these kind of modern uh, cultural phenomena have a lifespan maybe of 50 years or 100 years or something like that stoic philosophy flourished in the ancient world for five centuries mm. so between zeno and the death of Marcus Aurelius, it's just under 500 years during which the, 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 the Stoic school was a living, active force. And then it has this legacy that continues. It leaves a, an influence on Christianity, for example, and our culture that comes down to us today. But Marcus is the last, the swan song like, of Stoicism, the last famous Stoic of antiquity, and the most powerful politically of the Stoics. He was the emperor of Rome, kind of more or less at the height of its power as well. So he um, studied Stoicism. He dedicated his life to training himself in Stoicism. And he lived kind of like Hercules in a way. He faced these difficult tasks. He faced a plague, which is very relevant today. The, the Antonine Plague, um, which is named after him, he, he's, um, his cognomen, his, his name is Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. And uh, the Antonines, uh, that's the name of the dynasty that he was part of. So we call the plague that he, he, he had during his reign, the Antonine Plague. And we don't know what it was exactly. We think it might have been a form of smallpox. It was far worse than the current pandemic that we are facing. It's estimated to have killed 5 million people in the Roman Empire alone. And it, it continued for at least a decade. Mm, um, yeah. And uh, it, it devastated Roman society because the first thing that happened after the initial outbreak of the plague was that the, 
the Romans called the barbarians, the tribes on their frontiers, uh, saw that a lot of the legionaries were dying and they thought, seems like a good time to invade. <laughs> So not only did they have a plague, they also had a huge invasion of the northern provinces to deal with. So it's sometimes said, one of the historians, Cassius Dio, says uh, he thinks Marcus was one of the most admirable emperors, but one of the mo most unfortunate emperors, because he had earthquakes, plagues, he had yeah. uh, several invasions, and then he had a civil war to deal with. So all the way through his reign, he had trouble to deal with. And he left us this book called The Meditations, which really does seem to be private notes that he'd written down. I say there's, there, there are hints in the text that it, it, it wasn't, it doesn't look like it was written for publication for several reasons. And he wrote it largely, it seems, on the northern frontier, like in modern day uh, Austria, uh, Serbia, um, along the Danube when he was uh, commanding the Roman legions in this war. And so he, he wrote these books. Uh, he wrote this book to himself describing how he would apply Stoic philosophy to the problems that he was facing. And it's one of the most popular spiritual classics of all time. Mm. And it's available in many translations. And, uh, and so people find it a very relatable text. And it gives us an insight into, you could almost describe it, by the way, as a, uh, a manual for coping psychologically with a pandemic at a stretch. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's more than that. It's a manual for coping psychologically with a pandemic and, a, and, a, and an invasion. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And a Is bunch it, of, and a civil war. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And it's a, like a really good book. And uh, yeah. uh, if people, you know, I think a lot of people have seen the movie The Gladiator. So Marcus Aurelius is the emperor in there, the old emperor who yeah. dies or who was murdered by his son there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he was. He's also considered like the last of the last of the five good emperors. And he was like a very prestige pr prestigious uh, um, person in his uh, era. Yeah, Richard Harris plays him in the, in the movie Gladiator, and there's like one or two tiny references uh, to the philosophy. It's not a lot of philosophy. There's one or two little references to the, the philosophy in the movie Gladiator. But when that movie came out, a lot of people went out and bought the meditations, and it inspired them to become interested in Stoicism. Mm, yeah. And then since then, we have Ryan Holiday and Tim Ferriss and people I think who are responsible for introducing stoicism like you are as well through you know through your channel um to a whole new audience uh, of people who were, were maybe not all you know classicists and philosophers and stuff but people who have an interest in, in self-improvement let's say um and started to discover marcus aurelius so they there are millions of people in the around the world that have read the meditations of marcus aurelius and although it's a book in philosophy, most of them are academic philosophers. They're just yeah. people for whom it, it resonates uh, like a, a spirit, as a spiritual classic, a self-improvement classic. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's especially like uh, useful for uh, like preparing yourself for these uh, disasters and un uncertain situations like the, the pan pandemic or an invasion or <laughs> earthquakes, whatever it may be. And even like even everyday quarrels. And, uh, uh, you know, Marcus Aurelius is, has many examples where he pr embraces Stoic philosophy and uh, like this idea of being a virtuous character in his everyday life as well. Like he was betrayed many times. Um, he like, for example, he had to, or he, he sold a lot of his own personal possessions, his treasuries, to fund the war, and yeah, like many other examples where he actually lives uh, by this uh, Stoic philosophy. Yeah, I would say um, in some ways it's difficult to to evaluate his legacy as an emperor. We can do it to some extent. You know, there's little bits of evidence about laws that he passed. Um, we have the histories telling us about some of the actions that he took as an emperor. So we can, we can see that in some ways it was consistent. And there are some records of speeches that he gave where he seems to be saying surprising things that are arguably very consistent with Stoic philosophy. Um, but actually, the main thing I would say is that we know that during his lifetime, Marcus was famous as a philosopher. And people clearly throughout the empire perceived him. No one in any of the historical sources ever even suggests that he wasn't an exemplary uh, 
stoic uh, character, they all seem to almost take it for granted that he just embodies stoicism. You know, it's, it's one of those things that, that it's kind of almost unspoken. It's beyond question. Mm. You know, they go, no, he was, he's the philosopher king. Like, oh, 100%. He's a, you know, like mm. he embodies he, stoicism. He exemplifies how, it. How did he become like that? How, where did he learn stoicism? Well, he started off, I mean, again, this is a, a strange thing. I think it may be in part that he, one of the odd things we know about him is he lost his father when Marcus was maybe three or four years old. And so I do wonder if that's a factor that he, he we, we find that often, that people then go looking for a role model or a sense of direction in life, a father figure, right? And so Marcus turned to several men that became huge role models to him. And he was lucky that he found the right guides. He, one of them was the Emperor Antoninus Pius, who Marcus idolizes as a sort of ideal of what it means to be a wise emperor. And he systematically you know, is, is trying to model the qualities of his adoptive father, the emperor that preceded him. And then we also know his, Marcus's adoptive grandfather was the Emperor Hadrian. And Marcus doesn't really seem to think much of Hadrian. So he would be, a, Hadrian was much more associated with the Sophists. And Marcus, I think, viewed him as a bad role model. He doesn't want to be an emperor like Hadrian. He was uh, very pretentious uh, and, and kind of paranoid and stuff. And Marcus seems actually to have been quite worried that by becoming emperor himself, he might end up being turned into, like power might corrupt him and turn him into Hadrian. But then he seems to have been reassured by seeing Antoninus Pius and thinking, this guy seems to be able to pull it off. He seems to be able to be an emperor that's almost the opposite of Hadrian. He's you know, very down to earth, maintains his composure. He's not corrupted by power. So maybe it, it's possible to do this after all. And then he was lucky. I think also his mother, Marcus's mother was a... a an extremely wealthy woman, a very powerful Roman noblewoman. But paradoxically, she was known for her love of simplicity and Greek uh, culture and philosophy. So she was a very intelligent, very educated, very independent, uh, powerful woman. And she introduced Marcus to the circle of intellectuals, which included Stoic philosophers who went on to become his, his teachers. And the main one was a guy called Junius Rusticus, who became of one of several Stoic teachers, but the main one that Marcus seems to really identify with in the meditations, he tells us that Junius Rusticus was a very important figure in his, uh, his upbringing. Um, and he was a, a, a Roman general and a power, an important statesman. Um, and so Marcus uh, was mentored by him. Actually, Rust uh, Marcus uses the word therapia in the meditations, therapy. So he says Rusticus showed him that he would benefit from this stoic therapy for his character. And he also says... We think of Marcus as being this very serene character, but in the meditations, there are some hints that he struggled with his temper. So outwardly, the, he's described as a very calm person who's not easily infuriated by other people. But inwardly in the meditations, he says, I, I had to learn to control my temper. He said, in particular, the person that made me angriest of all was Junius Rusticus, my stoic teacher. <laughs> and I imagine, like we, I said earlier about Socrates, questioning Critopolis and saying, what would be the perfect friend? And so how many of those qualities do you have? Yeah. Like I imagine Rustic has probably asked Marcus questions like that and yeah. kind of really put him in the spot and, and challenged him very deeply. And sometimes that was irritating. Um, but he also really loved Rustic as we know that he, uh, he admired him greatly. So it's kind of like, oh, not like exactly a love hate relationship. But he loved this guy. He was his role model. We also found him very challenging to be around. Yeah. And maybe that was why partly he was drawn to him. Mm, yeah. So in a way, it was it was for him to uh, kind of suppress his demons or something of that you know in an easy way as as well as uh, just uh, uh, yeah be be the kind of person he wish he was sort of say or like aim towards his ideal. Actually, I'd never thought about it like this, but you know what we could say like, to link it to something else we've been talking about. So you and I have been talking a little bit about this idea of voluntary hardship that we have in stoicism and cynicism. So being willing to, to, to do exercise and, and kind of endure this, to tolerate discomfort. So this very passage in the meditations where Marcus says, look, I love this guy, I admire him, but sometimes I wanted to lose my temper with him. Now, someone else might have said, I'm done with this guy. 
he asks too many difficult questions. An Epicurean might say, he's upsetting my tranquility. You know, I'd rather find friends that, you know, are more relaxing to be around. But Marcus is willing to endure the company of mm. someone who he finds it difficult to listen to sometimes because he's being challenged by him. So he's voluntarily exposing himself to the discomfort of this guy's uh, criticisms, uh, mm. his questions, his challenging. And that, that's toughening Marcus up. That's one of the things that I think is leading him to become a, a stronger individual because he doesn't run away from criticism. Like he welcomes, he welcomes criticism even if it's kind of painful sometimes. And I, just as a little historical aside, this is speculation, but um, we think that Junius Rusticus died round about 170 AD which by coincidence seems to be around the time that Marcus begins writing the meditations. So I like to speculate that maybe Marcus began writing the meditations, these notes to himself, as a substitute for the loss of his main Stoic tutor. Um, and actually Marcus was on the frontier at the time, so he would have communicated with Rusticus by letter. So you can imagine the transition that he... We used to be with this guy every day. Now he only writes letters back, back and forth, and now, and now he dies. So instead of writing letters to Rusticus, Marcus now begins to write a letter to himself, and that evolves into the, the book that we have today, Meditations, which in the earliest manuscript, it, it was never called the Meditations. That's a title that we made up, that modern editors made up for it. The, the title on the earliest manuscript version is To Himself. Mm. Um. So it, it, if you think about it like that, it's easy to imagine this evolution. That he ends up becoming his own therapist, as we yeah. say today. He becomes his own life coach because the, the guy that was doing it for him has passed away. And this also is a good illustration of what we said about attachment to externals and that you know we must never become too attached to things. And for Stoics, the, 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 the most difficult example of that for the Stoics is they might say, well, we should learn to do without wealth. We should learn to do without power and reputation. But a big challenge for them would be, can you learn, though, to do without your teachers? Because yeah. those are the ones that help us to, to achieve this independence. Yeah. And so every Stoic, I think, must have thought, one day Zeno died, uh, Genius Rusticus died. You know, like, we're going to have to carry on doing Stoicism even once our teachers are gone. And uh, yeah. I think Marcus must have been preparing himself for that. Yeah, yeah, and the concept of death and uh, preparing for death is also very predominant in Stoicism. Like, it's a rem remembrance of death that you remember and keep in mind that you are going to die, so that you won't waste your time, and uh, at the same time you won't be like, let's say, you won't be completely destroyed if uh, someone someone close to you dies, or uh, for example, your teacher dies, or yeah, like your role role models, or even if you if you yourself die eventually. This might sound like an odd way to put it. I think during the pandemic, you know, one of the strange things about the pandemic is terrible as it is, and it, I think many people maybe underestimate how, how serious the, the pandemic actually is. But um, at the same time, it, it's almost certainly not going to be the thing that kills most people. You're far more likely to die from something else. I ultimately, although many people are going to die from this pandemic, you're more likely to die from from something else in fact but what it has done is made people confront the question of their own mortality much more we're surrounded by this kind of threat of death and, and stories every day about other people dying so people have started to reevaluate their priorities I think we live in a period where we're sheltered from death and really, if you study the, the lives of Romans and ancient Greeks, one thing that becomes very obvious is they were far, far more exposed to the reality of death than, than we are today. Yeah. Um, through sickness and disease, uh, infant mortality, through killing and butchering the animals that they ate, you know, they saw death much more at close quarters than, than we do today. Um, Marcus had 14 children and half of them died before he did. So, you know, like the death of children, bereavement was something that, can you ima even imagine that, you know, he, he'd lost seven children. Um, yeah. and it's bad enough. We think it's catastrophic enough today if somebody loses one child, you know, but to, to a Roman, it wouldn't be unusual to, to lose not even several, but many children. Like, um, 
and that he saw about his, his friends dying and also not even that someone would just die quietly in bed but Marcus watched people dying of a disease that was all over the surface of their bodies that they they died horribly and very visibly like something out of a horror movie I'm writing a graphic novel about Marcus Aurelius at the moment one of the things I didn't realize until we we really started to draw it is that a, a lot of it is a lot more like a horror story than I'd imagined <laughs> yeah. partly the plague but also a lot of the other thing the warfare that the, the way the Romans fought there's a passage in the meditations where Marcus mentions in a very casual way having seen uh, a body on a battlefield and the head is maybe several meters away from the rest of the body and that he says this seems kind of weirdly unnatural like you would see the body there and the head's over there like there's just there's just something odd about seeing these two things that separate that far apart it's a metaphor for him for what it's like when we get angry with other people and become alienated um, from the rest of mankind he says there's something very unnatural about someone that hates other people and it's as unnatural as seeing a head over there and the body over there. But he, the way, the casual way he mentions it, it is, seems odd to us today. That you know, this may be something that he'd seen many times as a, a commander on the, the northern frontier. Um, okay. And the Romans, uh, you know, were surrounded by you know a lot of brutality and warfare. And in the society and death and uh, and also for Marcus he, he had health problems for most of his adult life and also because of the threat of assassination which is very real for I think something like one quarter of Roman emperors were assassinated wow. Marcus must have more than we can even really imagine he must have woken up every day and thought I don't know is the plague gonna get me today <laughs> am I gonna be assassinated <laughs> am I gonna, am I gonna we're going to be surrounded by like t tens of thousands of, of Germans, like uh, invading, you know, besieging the city. That you know, like yeah, like so. His coming to terms with his own mortality is, is seems like more of an everyday thing, given the the time that he lived in. And it, to yeah. us, it's like a novel idea. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Coming to terms with your own mortality. I think to Marcus, it's almost like he didn't have a choice. <laughs> you know? yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, it's uh, like you know, you know, you know, like uh, of course, like death is uh, horrible, and uh, like people dying is also horrible. But at the same time, uh, it has maybe some like advantages or some benefits if you are like exposed to death, or at least in some shape or form. Uh, and yeah, like in the modern world, we are very distant from it. Like, and in a way, we kind of dehumanize death as well like we only see it in movies or we only see it in news reports we see you know some terrorists chopping someone's head off or something <laughs> and we kind of create this very negative uh, or like we we don't even take it that seriously and we don't even understand what it actually you know look, looks like or what it actually is i think i hadn't thought about this much until a few years ago and then it really dawned on me that there, that um you know people don't talk about death and bereavement in a way it, all, they don't talk about it all that much. But here's an odd thing. I, I was giving a talk once to a group of people in, in Toronto, and I, I just suddenly thought, I wonder how many people in the audience have actually had a brush with death. And so I asked them to show their hands, and there was maybe about two-thirds of the people in the audience that said that either through being in a dangerous situation or a health scare, they had a moment where they thought, maybe I'm going to die here. And, you know, also that, you know, there are many people that go th through life and don't experience much bereavement. I mean, Marcus was bereaved many times of friends and family members and children. And I lost my father when I was 14. He lost his father when he was about three or four years old. So some people are bereaved earlier in life um, of people that are closer to them, maybe bereaved several times. And other people are more kind of sheltered from that until later in life. And I think... The experience of bereavement of someone losing someone that's close to you or the experience of also being exposed to danger or having health scares it pertains not always but often it makes people reappraise their values so marcus says the obvious thing he says you're acting as if you're going to live for a thousand years and you know you're not and so you need to kind of stop and think about how you're actually spending your time. There's a famous quote where he says, stop arguing about what it means to be a good man and just be one, because the clock's ticking. You know, you could wake up dead tomorrow 
why you could get hit by a bus tomorrow. There was a famous uh, Athenian tragedian, you know, the Greek equivalent of this was that he had a, a, a skillies. Uh, he had a famously a bald head. And uh, one day they said he was walking about in Athens and there was an eagle that picked up a tortoise or many tortoises in Greece. And uh, this eagle was flying through the sky with the tortoise in it. Uh, to eat the tortoise, it would drop it on a rock and break the shell open. And it saw the shiny bald head of Aeschylus and uh, thought it was a rock. So it dropped a tortoise on him and he got killed by a tortoise, which is a double tragedy because not only was the tragedian killed, but also the tortoise. So the, that's the Greek equivalent of the English saying you could get hit by a bus tomorrow. You could get hit by a tortoise for all you know. Yeah. You don't know when you're going to go. Um, there are, you know, 101 ways, a million and one ways that you could die. It could be the pandemic. It could be something else that gets you. But Marcus is constantly saying to himself, listen, you need to, you know, hurry up and make something of your life and stop acting as if you've got all of the time in the world. You know, you could die in your sleep tonight. Seneca says something quite dark like um, about this, but again, he takes death very seriously. And he says to himself every night when he goes to sleep, he would say, I might not wake up tomorrow. And uh, every morning when he woke up, he would say to himself, you know, uh, I might not uh, sleep again tonight. You know, I might not make it through the day for all I know. Um, so the Stoics basically want to snap out of this kind of trance and think, this is your, this could be your last chance here right now in this very moment to actually be the sort of person that you want to be. You know, but, you know, the strange thing is if you look at people as a therapist, we often, especially with clinically depressed patients, we'll, we'll ask them to keep a record of how they spend their day. And it may be that they spend most of their day just doing stuff to kill time. Given how precious time is, it's strange how much of our time is spent doing things purely to kill time. Like, so they'll play computer games, they'll watch TV that they're not really that interested in. Um... You know, they'll just like sleep in bed longer. Uh, they'll get drunk, they'll take drugs just to make time kind of pass quicker. Right. Like, and it's like a, being in a trance. Uh, Marcus also compares it to, to people sleepwalking. He says you need to kind of snap out of it like, mm. and actually do something with your life. You know, like like in the legend of Hercules, so you can step back and say, yeah, like I'm, uh, I feel like I, I did something that I can take pride in. Mm. Yeah, totally. And uh, it's it's uh, like if you get stuck in that, let's say, trance uh, or that sleepwalking, then it's very hard to get out of it. And uh, you, you only get out, usually people get out of it if something terrible happens to them, like they get diagnosed with some cancer or uh, some yeah. disease or like they go broke, uh, they lose their job uh, or yeah, something dangerous happens to their uh, family or something. And then they try to do something and try to change uh, you, you know it, it can be like a good turnaround it can work it, they can definitely like change their life completely but at the same time it can also be too late so to say it can be very uh, very difficult to start a healthy diet if you have already existing uh, like cardiovascular disease or something so you have to kind of already already do those things proactively and on a regular basis and uh, kind of keep yourself in check and uh, and also remind yourself that that those things they can happen, and in a in a in a weird way, like those things are almost like guaranteed to happen. <laughs> like uh -huh. uh, we're going to inevitably get some sort of a disaster. We're going to miss the bus, or we're going to uh, get hit by some sort of a disease, a p pandemic, whatever it may be. So the most rational and the most logical thing would be to just prepare for those things in advance. And uh, in so doing, you're also like just increasing your uh, ability to deal with those things as well as your overall like you know peace of mind and um, mental uh, resilience this is like the stoic idea of premeditating adversity um so preparing in advance like you say and also the other thing the stoics say is if you look around you can see all of the bad stuff that happens to other people it, they said they thought it was really weird that people go i can't believe this has happened to me <laughs> Because the Stoics would say, well, whenever someone says that, the thing that's happened to them is usually something that happens to most other people. Yeah. I can't believe someone's burgled my apartment. Well, people get burgled every day, dude. You know, like it's, it's a thing that happens, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I, can't, I can't believe that I've got some sickness or illness or whatever, like, like cancer, heart disease. Well, it's a thing that happens. Like people, yeah. like almost everyone will die eventually. Seneca almost jokes about it and says, look, you know, like, 
you look around the world, the single most obvious fact about human nature that you learn from looking around is that we all die. I mean, it's a no-brainer, right? But people kind of live in denial of their own mortality. The, 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 the one thing that's like 100% absolutely going to happen to you eventually, and probably, you know, most of us will develop some sort of health problems at some point in life through old age or, you know, um, the longer you live, the more likely you are to have some kind of issues that you have to struggle with physically. Uh, relationship breakups. There are very few people that meet their childhood sweetheart and marry them and are with them for the rest of their life, especially today, right? Yeah. So, you know, you, again, people go, I can't believe my girlfriend left me. I'm like, well, that, surely that, that's a thing that happens is like 99% of it at some point. Yeah. You know, like most relationships are going to end. You, most people have more than one partner over the course of their life. So, Therefore, like, you know, it's likely relationships are going to end. Um, but people, the so it's thought it's strange that people act surprised. And actually, if you're wise, if you were just the ideal wise man or woman, you would think these things happen in life. C'est la vie. You know, people steal your wallet sometimes. Like, you get sick sometimes. The pandemic's a good example of that in, a, in terms of society as a whole. So people being kind of surprised, but the experts, the epidemiologists are all like, we told you guys yeah. it was going to be a pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like, you know, the airplanes, <laughs> they mm -hmm. go from one country to like, there's going to be a pandemic eventually. And then people have asked me, how would uh, Stoics cope with a pandemic that's happening? And actually the first answer to that often you know, the answer to a question is to say you're asking the wrong question, right? The, the Stoics would say, well, you, a good Stoic would already have prepared for it years ago. Mm. Like, they would have thought maybe there's going to be some catastrophic illness that affects society. It's quite plausible. If you look at history, this is something that happens periodically throughout history, right? Even in the 20th yeah. century, we've had pandemics. So... Um, the first answer would be Stoics would prepare in advance. And actually that applies to the current pandemic because one of the paradoxes about it is, although this, I think, like I said, is probably worse than many people realize, um, this virus has a relatively low fatality rate. And, uh, you know, we could quite easily have had a highly contagious virus with a much higher fatality. Like Ebola has a 50% fatality rate. Yeah. So, you know, I, ironically, I hate to say, we kind of got off lightly. Yeah. Exactly. And so, you know, in a parallel universe, like we, we had a pandemic with something that was much more fatal. And on the positive side of it, if there is one, you know, maybe this makes our society more resilient in the face of future pandemics. Like, because there'll be other yeah. worse viruses that are coming down the pipe towards us in the future. Yeah. You know, maybe we'll be more prepared for them. We'll, we'll know what to expect. So the stoic advice would be, this is an opportunity actually to prepare for the possibility that there might be other crises in our society in the future that are even more serious than this one. And I, I guess it's kind of like a wake, a wake up call. That's how a stoic, I think, would actually spend this time partly maybe coping with the situation that they're in, but also thinking this should alert me to the fact that there might be even more serious challenges to come further down the line in the future. Um, and just as an aside, by the way, you know, people, I, I, one thing I'd point out just to plant some seeds for people to think about. First of all, by the way, uh, uh, to digress slightly, um, the Stoics and Socrates wanted to help people deal with the sophists, these uh, orators and rhetoricians that manipulated people's emotions by giving powerful evocative speeches to them. Uh, and they often instigated uh, people to, to wage war and things like that. And then well, they manipulated them politically. And so people think oh, that's a, an interesting historical um, curiosity. Uh, I think we, social media, is the modern day sophist. Mm. You know, every, everything that Socrates and the, the Stoics say about how do you deal with these sophists is, is really relevant to us today. It's just that it's an algorithm now, yeah. or it's the, you know, the, the news media and stuff manipulated us in the way that the, the sophists manipulated them. But the other parallel that I would draw in terms of the current pandemic is the Stoics talk a lot about the problem of exile. So the problem would be for them that what if the emperor sends you off to live on some island in your own because you've been banished from the empire. So they talk about that as an example. And, and living in, in lockdown, 
present some of the same challenges as being sent into exile, arguably. So that makes a lot of the things that they say more relevant to our current situation than people might realize at first. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. And like, uh, yeah, we, well, as bad as the pandemic has been, it's ne not nearly as bad as it could have been. And even like the Spanish flu was uh, far more deadly. And uh, yeah, like, it is a definitely like an opportunity to like prepare for the future ones that uh, will and as we come eventually. We don't know when, but uh, the only thing that we can do is uh, prepare ourselves and uh, just, uh, you know, practice the skill sets and practice the mindset of uh, being under like a higher amount of stress and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, what what about uh, how did uh, Marcus Aurelius die? Uh, what what was death like, and what happened afterwards? Well, in my book, I kind of take a particular interpretation of his death, right? So we do we actually have several accounts of his death, and even of the location of his death. But um, we most scholars believe it's it it seems to be that he died of the Antonine Plague, um, and he was. You know, he was about 60 when he died, so he reached a, a, a reasonable age um, for a, a Roman at that time. And uh, he died, um, unfortunately, like he was succeeded by his son, Commodus. Uh, so some people are very interested in why on earth uh, Marcus Aurelius allowed Commodus, this terrible kind of corrupt emperor, uh, to succeed him. And there's a long story there, but I'll give you the very abbreviated version of it. It's, a it's actually quite a complicated question. But the Romans were, the thing that they were most scared of, more, maybe more scared of even than the plague, was civil war. They were worried that their empire would fragment, which is ultimately what happened to it anyway. But they were always conscious it would be very easy like for them to lose control of one of the provinces and for it just to split off of the empire to fragment. So they were extremely concerned about the risk of a, a civil war happening and splitting the empire. And I think they thought that even a bad emperor would potentially be better than no emperor at all or, or having several competing emperors like tearing the empire to pieces. So they wanted, uh, they, I think the Senate thought, uh, Marcus's son has to be emperor to try and unite things, uh, even if he doesn't really seem to have the strength of character that would make him good at the job. And Marcus seems to have done several things to try and prevent that. You mentioned the movie Gladiator. You know, like so, people will often say the movie Gladiator is a work of fiction, so it really builds a story that's loosely based. But there are bits of it. Some of the bits of it that people think are most implausible are actually kind of. Uh, have parallels in, in, in the histories. So the, the character that Russell Crowe plays, um, there, what, Marcus Aurelius had a son-in-law uh, who was one of his senior generals in the northern frontier, a guy called uh, Tiberius Claudius Pompeianus. And he was of humble birth. He was actually Syrian, not Spanish. Um, and according to the histories, Marcus even wanted him to become a kind of interim ruler and that he, he asked this guy to become a, a kind of mentor, a guardian for Commodus and try and, and keep him out of trouble. But Commodus abandoned him and went back to Rome and became corrupted by easy living and stuff like that. Um, so they, really the, the empire went into decline following the, the death of Marcus Aurelius, unfortunately. Um, but uh, like I say, I, I think that was their best attempt to try and avoid a, a civil war and, and hold the empire together in a very difficult period. I mean, so people have often argued what caused the decline of the Roman Empire, but the Antonine Plague probably didn't help. Mm, yeah, and, definitely. Uh, you know, the, the, the various invasions that they, they had to, to deal with. Mm, yeah, it was a like, combination of uh, several bad things, <laughs> wars and yeah. uh, plagues. Uh, but uh, what what do you think about uh, or why did did why why did Commodus fail to you know live up to the same as his father like didn't Marcus Aurelius put enough like time and effort into educating his son or what what was the problem? Well, again, this a long story. Actually, I wrote a, a, a blog article about this. It's pretty long and pretty detailed, so I'll try and be concise. Um, generally speaking, Roman noblemen didn't spend that much time with their children. 
and particularly the emperor would be too busy. Although slightly contradicting that, we have Marcus's private letters where he seems to talk about how he's unusually close to his family and mentions spending time with him. But I think once the plague happened and the, the war started, Marcus went to Austria, his son was in Rome most of the time, although he perhaps was brought out to see him sometimes. So I don't, I don't think he really spent that much time with him. He just tried to get him the best teachers that he could. Then when Commodus reached adulthood in Rome, that was when he was 15 years old, Marcus had him accompany him uh, in, the, in the military camps and he spent more time with him. But by then it was maybe a little bit too late to properly shape his character. Now, one of the historians, I think it's Herodian, says that Commodus wasn't an evil man, but he was weak and gullible and easily manipulated. And he was, again, we think Marcus, Commodus, but we have to think there's a whole array of other people around them. Yeah. And Herodian said the problem was that Commodus was surrounded by a lot of hangers-on. And they kept saying, let's go back to Rome, let's go back to Rome, let's go back to Rome, because we can party and we can have these banquets. We can have a great time there. Like, let's, the, the legionary camps suck and it's dangerous here. <laughs> right? And so as soon as Marcus died, Commodus bailed on the military. And I suppose that Marcus pleaded with him. He said, you need to stay with the legions, like, but Commodus was like, no, because I don't want to die of the plague, or I don't want to die in war, so all my friends are constantly pouring poison in my ear, saying we need to go back to Rome, um, mm -hmm. and so he went back to Rome. Now, the problem, Roman emperors need to maintain power, either with the support of the military, the support of the Senate, or the support of the general public, and Marcus, first of all, had the Senate 100% behind him. And then he later won over the military, and the public were kind of uh, liked him, but they, you know, they they perhaps didn't think he was enough of a, a populist. Um, Commodus annoyed the military; he abandoned them. Like the Senate didn't trust him, so his only option, as with some other emperors, was to try and be a populist and went over the general public. And in doing that, he turns himself into a celebrity. They say he used to sprinkle gold dust on his hair. And he but had statues of himself dressed like the god Hercules. He wanted to really big himself up. So he went on this downward spiral whereby in order to survive, like he had to win the love of the people. And in doing that, he sold out, we would say today. And it inevitably led to a kind of corruption and mistrust. And Marcus would have thought that's like the worst possible way to govern. Like, you know, you can't just constantly be trying to, to, to win popular acclaim. Like, it's going to lead to some terrible decisions and also squandering lots of money on bread and circuses to keep the people happy, like throwing big, spectacular yeah. games. And Commodus fought as a gladiator many times in the arena, like probably with blunted weapons, right? But he, he literally, the easiest way to describe it is that he turned himself into a celebrity figure. Mm -hmm. like, and Marcus would have thought, this is a terrible idea. Right. And so he was assassinated uh, uh, relatively early on in, in his reign. Mm, okay. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> the, the perfect, the perfect the, like a contrast between some aspect of the Epic Epicureanism and uh, Stoicism from uh, Marcus Aurelius. So, yeah. Yeah, he doesn't really seem to have internalized very much of his lessons. For, but although we're told that Marcus tried to find mentors and, and teachers to, to look after him um, but I think we have to imagine that there were would have been other people at court surrounding him kind of try to manipulate him and drag him in the other direction hmm. yeah well uh, it's been really great talking with you and uh, the book is uh, very fascinating and uh, packed with like the his history of Marcus Aurelius and Rome as well as like these practical um, lessons of stoicism as well as you know everyday life so uh it's a really good combination of everything and it's a fascinating read so uh before i ask my last question uh, where can people learn more about you and your work well if they just go to my website it's just my name donald robertson dot name instead of dot com so donald robertson dot name and then there's lots of blog articles i write on medium i have a bunch of free downloads and e-learning courses and stuff that people can access and they'll find out about my other books and they can follow me on social media and stuff via the website. Mm. And uh, like, what is your next book about? 
you mentioned. It's a graphic novel. Um, I don't know if I've got some pages like kicking about. I could show you, but it's about the life of Marcus Aurelius and his philosophy. Um, so it'll be out probably late next year, maybe next fall. Uh, it takes longer to do a graphic novel because the artwork takes a while. And I think it, what really hit me is that it, Marcus's story seems very different, I think, when you actually visualize it on the page. I'll mention something briefly about that. I think one of the reasons that people love the meditations, and people might not notice this at first, is that it's kind of abstract. So Marcus talks a lot about loss and anxiety, but he seldom mentions the, the stuff that's actually going on around him, except in very vague terms. Um, he never, uh, he mentions the, the Antonine Plague only once in passing. Um, he talks about dealing with difficult people, meddlesome and deceitful people. But the way he says it, you might imagine that it's just one of his relatives or something like that, one of his friends. Not that he's facing a whole civil war like they could uh, of world historic uh, proportions. Um, so the appealing thing about the, the meditations is you can kind of project yourself into the, the things that he's saying because he, 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 he talks about them without adding many historical details in. But then if you try and imagine, if you take those passages from the meditations, one of the most famous passages says, every morning when you wake up, tell yourself that you're going to have to deal with petty and deceitful and arrogant people. If you take that passage and then imagine that he's writing it in a legionary camp uh, on the Danube and that he's surrounded by emissaries from these nations that he's engaged in war with and senators who are conspiring against him, then suddenly the significance of the passages takes on a whole different dimension in terms of the environment in which he's writing them, I think. So I, I hadn't even realized how, how good an idea this was in a way until we got into the middle of doing it. And I suddenly thought, wow, yeah, it really brings a whole new perspective to the stuff that he's saying. Hmm. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm working on at the moment. Nice. Yeah, looking forward to it. And uh, it's going to be a good one. And uh, my last question is, uh, what's this one piece of advice or habit you wish you adopted sooner? Um, there's a couple of key things that I think from Stoicism are useful. There are many practical ideas in Stoicism. I think the one thing that really... One of the things that kind of triggered the modern Stoicism movement was actually a particular exercise called the view from above that Marcus talks about quite a lot. And it's training yourself to really think of your life in terms of a much broader context, in terms both of space and time. So the easy way of doing that is just to picture the situation you're in as if you're viewing it from really, really high above and thinking of your current situation as just a small spot in time and space. Um, and I, I, you know, I could talk all day about that. I won't. But it, it's it, in terms of what we know about modern psychology, it's a very profound. It's actually something that modern researchers are, are have become interested in in the Stoic literature because there are good, solid reasons from research and cognitive psychology to think this could potentially be a, a very sound idea, a very powerful idea. So it's this idea of expanding. Our perspective which modern scholars call the view from above it's a very useful way of getting perspective in your life and also of learning to overcome attachment or anxiety and other uh, troubling emotions mm, yeah and in a way it's like you you realize that you you're like you as a person are like very <laughs> it sounds very sounds very like uh, negative but you're like very like very insignificant in the grand universe so to say you're just a very this tiny thing <laughs> and uh, yeah like we there are people who have had similar problems and there will be people who will have like even worse problems and that sort of thing so there's nothing like really special in in like solving them I'll leave you with a paradox. I said the Stoics and Socrates love these paradoxes, but you know, you should. We should feel that it's paradoxical that we are learning about this technique mainly um, from one of the most powerful figures in mm. the history of of Europe, that Marcus Aurelius, uh, who commanded the Roman Empire at the height of its power, would sit there and picture his life seen from above as if it was 
uh, merely a tiny speck in the vastness of cosmic space and remind himself. He says to himself repeatedly in the meditations that once you're dead, people won't remember your name after a while. Eventually, you'll be completely forgotten, which is easy for us to say today, but for him to say that as a Roman emperor, it, it, it takes more effort in a way because he was surrounded by people building statues of him. And yet he had the strength and independence of mind to say, you know, these eventually, eventually these statues are all going to crumble to dust. You know, it doesn't matter who you are. You know, it won't last forever. You just need to focus like on acting uh, in a way that's in accord with your own core values and not place any uh, real significance on what other people think of you or your legacy after you die in terms of your reputation and so on. You know, just be a good man, as he says and do, you know, remain committed to doing what you think is right. Forget about the statues and history books and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a perfect uh, note to end the show with as well. And yeah, uh, glad to talk with you and uh, looking forward to your uh, future books. Yeah, likewise, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me along to speak to you today. Yeah, no problem. All right, that's it for this episode. If you want to support us, then leave us a review on iTunes and the other social media platforms. You can also share it with a friend. If you want to learn more about the topics that we discussed in this episode, then check out my new book, Stronger by Stress. But on that, thanks for listening to this episode. My name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.